good afternoon and uh, thank you very much, Professor Harams, for this nice introduction. So um, if you were early for this meeting, which maybe isn't a very common uh, place in Africa to be early for something, um, but then uh, you would have seen some of this footage. And this is just basically to give you a bit of context of what I mean when I say I'm talking about the SI Gallus 2 in Antarctica, and we literally are experiencing a full landscape of ice. And today I would like to talk about, um, you know, uh, does like sensor data agree when the captains say that the ship is at a limit? So, and it's actually about a very special voyage that I was taking part in earlier this year, where. Um, we had gone on a wreck hunt for the shipwreck of Sir Ernest Shackleton, which is then um, buried underneath the Antarctic ice. And when you're an academic, you very quickly realize that absolutely nothing that you do is ever alone, because you definitely need the interdisciplinary um, knowledge, the other skills like man labor, babysitters, you know, things that actually make your research possible. So this is definitely a collaborative effort. So um, then, you know, the SA Gallus II, um, she's a very, very special ship and an early type of ship. Um, Antarctica by is a desert. Africa, the driest, windiest, coldest, harshest place on Earth. It's almost twice the size of Australia and colder than the Arctic. The temperature gets as low as minus 90 degrees Celsius and wind speeds as high as 300 kilometers per hour. Summer days are 24 hours long, and in winter, nights can bring an entire month of darkness. It is here that we get the best window on our geospace, combined with an unspoiled physical environment, hoarding millions of years of evidence describing the Earth's history. It has a unique system of government, Antarctica belongs to no one. An international treaty gives all countries the right to study this pristine environment and protects it as a natural reserve devoted to science and peace. Arctic research. Maintaining a base in Antarctica poses huge logistical challenges for the transportation of personnel, equipment, hazardous cargo and supplies. For close to 35 years, the South African Department of Environmental Affairs Research and Supply Vessel, S.A. Agullas, has been the lifeline to operations here and on Marion and Gough Islands. With the S.A. Agullas reaching the end of its working life for such punishing conditions, DEA took the decision to replace its flagship with a new purpose-built vessel to take over these duties using the latest technology. This ship would have to be a tanker, cargo carrier, passenger ship, research vessel, helicopter carrier, and an icebreaker. Such a vessel has never been built. The ship comprises 26 what they call grand blocks. Those are big structures like the one behind us. And then the ship is constructed in the building dock. Each of the uh, blocks are then put together. They put in the bottom of the yard, completed. They push together a line and then weld it up. A major milestone of the build is the installation of the ship's engines. Four six-cylinder Vatsila 32 diesel engines make up the main power generation system. Each engine generates 3,000 kilowatts of electric power for the two 4,500 kilowatt electric propulsion motors, each driving a variable pitch propeller. During 20 weeks, we have lifted all the blocks so putting those dirty blocks together, we have created this complete shape of the hull. It, all scientific equipment must also be demonstrated by manufacturer representatives. A drop keel can be lowered through the bottom of the ship to a depth of three meters below the keel. It houses the transducers for measuring the density of plankton layers, small fish and ocean currents. The large environmental hangar door can be opened at sea to facilitate the operation of deep water probes to a depth of 6,000 meters. The ship has deep coring facilities for geological science, capable of sampling seabed sediments to a depth of 5,000 meters. A hydraulic A-frame on the stern allows for towing sampling nets and dredges and deploying or retrieving current meter arrays. 
A moon pool extends from the environmental hangar down through the ship's hull. It can be used as an alternative launch area in pack ice. The shape of the bow is critical for breaking ice. The bow was designed in Rauma and refined by subsidiary company Aka Arctic in Helsinki. Aka Arctic has the world's only privately owned ice model testing facility and has been involved in 60% of the world's icebreakers. This engineering would now be put to the test as the vessel is taken north to find ice during the ice trials. The so I think um, I'd like maybe like to stop here, but if you can imagine that um, we are actually a country in possession of an asset such as the SAO Gallus II, which is basically the only stake of our continent in Antarctic science. And the significance that Antarctica and Southern Ocean has, you know, for food security, you know, our whole blue economy, economy which is like we want to boost through Operation Pakisa, you know, um, this vessel and the fact that we are able to take students to Antarctica and actually have a presence also of young scientists in this environment really presents us with a massive opportunity. So I would like to talk to you then um, about my, um, how I'm going to structure it today. So I want to talk about full-scale measurements on the ship, so why it would be scientifically interesting. And in parallel with that, I would like to paint to you maybe a little bit of the expedition of Sir Ernest Shackleton and my own experiences in Antarctica. And on top of that, I would like to say, well, if we are doing all this science, um, then it, like engineering has to be applied. It has to be useful to someone. And I think the main user of ship science, one of them, would certainly be an ice pilot or the ship captain. And how does the science that we are doing on the ship actually correlate with what engineering science is measuring? Um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about the exciting future um, of digitization and where I think that these type of research work can go. So firstly, we are involved in something which is called full-scale measurements on the SAO Gallus. So that means you have the actual big ship operating in the Antarctic environment and we are sticking sensors on the ship and we are watching what she is doing while she is going about her normal day at work. And the aim of this would be to extend the scientific basis for the design of ice going ships. That's where the whole project started. So, I mean, and if you think about, you know, what you saw there, um, they have a model scale ship being towed along a fancy Finnish swimming pool. And then we are observing things there and we are saying, okay, let's take people into the harshest environment on Earth. And the fact is, engineers don't know exactly what will happen there. Because the question we want to ask is, what are the loads? Like, what is the ship going to face in her working life? And then the second question is, how will she respond to that? And could we make better engineering designs? And you could ask, well, in this day and age of digital model modeling and engineering science, is this still necessary? And here I have uh, three short examples. Maybe if we start right here on the left with a propeller picture. You know, in 2003, the Baltic Sea. So this is a very, very calm sea with lots of ice. And it's also, there's a lot of ship traffic there. So it's one of the busiest um, like shipping areas in, in areas of permanent ice cover in the winter. And all those numbers are very small, but what I would like to show you is that, do you see that, I mean, there was 36 plus three, so that's 39 cases of ships reporting either propeller or propulsion damage. And if you keep in mind that the most expensive part or system to replace on a ship is actually the propulsion system, then like this type of damage becomes like a financial decision driver, i.e. it is something that the shipping industry is willing to invest in. And at this point, people are scheduling maintenance intervals on a certain amount, like a six months or an annual basis, without real knowledge of the effect that ice has on propulsion machinery and its damage. In 2018, I mean the first world, like USA, like they had propulsion failure or engine machinery failure and flooding when they were on an Antarctic relief voyage, resupply voyage. 
And then the other thing which people do not want to talk about, because in principle, I mean, there is a decision as to whether we want to support tourism in Antarctica, yes or no. But through gateways in South America, like Ushuaia, I mean, the cruise industry is operating and they are bringing tourists into the Antarctic area. And here is a graph which I actually finally got to plot only this morning with the numbers. Because, you know, I think in 1992, we started something like 6,000 and something people touching onto the Antarctic continent or ice. And last year, um, it was almost like 46,000. And those people are bring, being brought in by yachts and cruise vessels. Keeping in mind that the vessel number has not grown beyond 52 vessels in the last five years. So what is being done? These vessels are being used more regularly in these loading conditions, which we have no idea of. But we have the finished swimming pool, right? So to this end, I mean, our measurements actually seek to inform what the ship's response is, so, and how human response, so can people still remain awake and remain productive and do their work well in this environment? And finally, the environmental conditions. So if we had to guess, well, we have to design a ship for this type of ice, for this thickness, this concentration, what do we actually encounter? So we are building up this database bit by bit. And you know, in the very beginning, when they were putting those blocks of the ship together, one by one by one, this um, university, Alta University, they were involved, their professor has been involved in full-scale measurements for more than 30 years. So they actually designed a system which was installed during this manufacturing phase, where they stick sensors on the hull which can measure the loading of the ice on the plating. So you can almost imagine that the ship is wading through the water and the ice put the ice back, but you can't put the hull. And the risk that you have there is that the ice pressure could really pierce the hole, number one. But the second function would be that you would be able to determine how much is this ice resisting the movement of the ship. And this could better enable you to specify the correct amount of propulsion power to drive you through the ice. So we are measuring of these loads like on the bow where the ship is impacting the ice on the bow shoulder and on the stern shoulder. And we found actually in Antarctic operations that the stern shoulder at the back doesn't get loaded that often because we are not a ship who is purposefully maneuvering in the ice. Most of the time we are doing logistic work and we are trying to go around it. And then if we have to go through the ice, we go straight and as short as possible using the strongest part of our bow. And this part, um, is some vibration measurements. So I don't know if you can remember Sir Isaac Newton, high school, F equals MA, the force equals the mass times the acceleration. Now my sensors, these dots that you see there, are accelerometers. So they measure the acceleration of the ship's hull. And the implication of that, we are capturing that at 6,000 samples per second, is that we actually get to see every bend and twist that the ship makes, like as she's going through the heavy waves and the thick ice of Antarctica. So they tell us how the ship is displacing. And well, there is a lot of research going into figuring out what the forces are that the ship actually experiences. But we have not quite arrived there yet. And then, as you have seen you know, from this report in the Baltic and uh, this USA vessel that ran into trouble in Antarctica. The propulsion system is quite something that you have to be very careful about um, when you are navigating in ice. And the thing that makes this quite difficult is that the, the loading onto the, the shaft line and the propellers, so they're spinning in the water, and the problem is that this propeller would impact ice. But you cannot measure on the propeller. Because if you put a sensor there, it would get completely obliterated. And this shaft um, on the SA Gallus, I don't have a technical drawing here, but it's, it's almost 20 meters long. It's long. 20 meters, that's six stories. You can get, look into the windows of House Wichte, seventh floor, if you could stand on top of that shaft. It's high, it's long. So you need really long cables also 
to get that far, and they have to be able to operate in icy water. So what we as engineers do is we measure on the shaft somewhere where we're able to get access, and then we have to lean onto mathematics to try and figure out what happens at the propeller. And guess what? There's no way yet to validate it. So we are back in the swimming pool and in our computers making models. But at least we can now measure something. And then, of course, it makes no sense at all to measure all these things you know, about what the ship is doing if you don't know the cause. So you have to know, like, why is she responding like this? And you know, our students that get to go to Antarctica, they do, and they definitely do not miss one minute. Because the moment we go into ice, they have to stand on the bridge and make manual observations of ice. So they have to look out of the window and tell us how thick is the ice now, how it, what is the concentration, and what do you um, guess the flow size is. So the flow is like an ice pancake that's floating there. And it could be two meters or just like brash ice, like thin, um, like crumpled up slush puppy, or it could be several kilometers. And when you are getting into flows of several kilometers, that is when ships actually get into trouble. But we have this yardstick on the side, and those are 10 centimeter increments. And in ideal ice conditions, as the ship passes, the ice will flip along the side of the ship, and then you can make a guess. And then we are trying to engage with this digital era where we have stereo camera, cameras that are like suspended off the side. So two cameras that look down at the ice. If you know how far it is, you can use triangulation. And then you can, if you have a good automatic algorithm or a student that could watch three months worth of footage, <laughs> can make it semi-automatic. You can also get you know, um, an Im image processing type of guess. But we are making progress there. And this is with Otto University in Finland. And then the ice concentration. So I think this is also some very, very promising work um, where a student has used machine vision to guess what the concentration of the ice is and the flow size. So you have a camera on the main mast of the ship looking forward, and you have to correct for the ship's motion and also for the perspective. And you can see um, the shadow of the ship still in some of those images with the crane. But around that, you have an area which you can analyze. And one of the potential benefits of this is that, you know, from satellite images, if people want to um, estimate like what the weather in the area is and what the ice cover is, ice concentration is one of the most poorly observed or um, analyzed type of metrics to extract from ice cover. So the potential here is that the ship could be like a local observer which, if you have lots of these observations, could help to improve satellite data. OK. So that's a summary of these full-scale measurements. And um, I think, all in all, we have more than 200 sensors on board, who are me which are measuring all the time. So this is a way over investment, like academic, over the top. Now um, I want to bring in the next part, which is this Weddell Sea Expedition. And what is it? Well. It was a very, very special 45-day voyage, and it was scheduled in the middle of the conventional Antarctic relief voyage. So normally, the SIA Gallus leaves for Antarctica in um, December. Then um, she goes to Aktabukta. She downloads cargo. And also the next overwintering team and scientists are going to work on the base. Then she leaves Antarctica, and she goes on something we call the boy run to South Georgia. Um, and after about three weeks, she returns, and then they do the backloading of the ship. And they take the scientists who have been overwintering for one year, they take them back to South Africa, so then they go again from Antarctica to Cape Town. Um, and this year, the Weddell Sea Expedition interrupted that, where the ship had made it to Antarctica and done her offloading, and then they scheduled 45 days in between where the Weddell Sea Expedition would take part. And the plan was um, to basically go into this area of the Weddell Sea. So I will zoom in on more specialized maps a bit later. But the Weddell Sea is the circled area there. And on the very west side, you see this Antarctic Peninsula um, on, the west, the, uh, on the west side of the Weddell Sea. And this is where, in 2017, um, from the Larsen Sea ice shelf, they broke a massive iceberg broke off there. And the thing about this is that it exposes new ice. 
So if you, for instance, wanted to ask um, oceanographic questions like what animals are living under the ice shelf, underneath it, then if you had a big part that broke off, and then, then you can get better access to those areas. If you were asking questions like how old is the Earth, or you know, what is really our ice dating history, is global warming a new thing, then you want to get access to those strata, those layers of ice. So a fresh break kind of gives you like huge potential for new science. And this expedition wanted to go right there. But the other great potential reward would be to go after the world's hardest to find shipwreck, which is that of Ernest Shackleton. So stuck at 3,000 meters depth, under ice, which hardly ever melts, it's multi-year ice in the Weddell Sea. So the question is, could we actually get to this location? And just a little bit about um, Ernest Shackleton. But, you know, he was 40 when he re uh, led this Trans-Antarctic expedition. Um, so they came from the UK to Antarctica, and their plan was to go on land close to the Weddell Sea, then cross through the South Pole to um, the opposite end of Antarctica by foot, and then be collected by another ship on the other side, and then taken back. And this was also at the start of the First World War. So this is a man heading almost exactly in the opposite direction of anyone else. And he was 40, and so am I this year, I'm 40. So it was just kind of this amazing leader, and I'm thinking like, this is what he could achieve in 40 years, and can I really keep up with that? But you know, they got stuck in January, and we were in Antarctica in January. It's very, very much summer and full of ice. But the thing is, like, when you get to 24 February, and you realize that soon the seasons are turning, and you are responsible for 26 or 27 other men, and you are looking at winter on the ship, stuck in ice. And that is what happened to them. For 10 months, they were stuck. And in November, um, I'm sorry because it is a bit difficult to talk about it, because I was, um, you'll see now, we also got to look at these diaries of the men who were on board the ship. And in Shackleton's diary, his handwriting changes the day that this happened, that the endurance is indeed crushed by the ice. He writes a certain way, which you cannot read, and then he writes a very different way. So they were, the, the ship was crushed and lost, and then they camped on the ice in the winter. And when the ice started breaking up around them, they had three lifeboats, and they decided that they would now go by foot and drag these lifeboats across the ice until they find open water and the closest island. And they were actually, I think, about 100 nautical miles away from Paulette Island, but the ice was just simply impossible. So I think what happened is they finally had an, another camp on a big floe, which literally split in two, and um, with someone's tent actually um, stationed like right across the place where it was breaking. And um, then they decided to turn to the boats and they made it as far as Elephant Island, which is at least solid ground, but nothing more than a very, very desolate and uninhabitable rock in the Antarctic Ocean, and with very, very severe tidal swings. So Shackleton then left on the James Curd, a small survival craft, and it was him and four other men, and they made it like 1,300 kilometers to South Georgia, which is where they had set out from. But they landed on the wrong side, where, or the uninhabited side, and then still had to cross over a mountain range. Um, and he, they said that he knocked on the whaler's door, the, like the, the people who would do whaling in South Georgia, and the leader of um, that group of people, he knocked on the door of this man. And when he opened the door, the man did not recognize him until he said, I am Ernest Shackleton. So, their state had severely deteriorated, and it took four attempts for them to go back to Elephant Island and rescue the remaining 22 stranded people there. So amazing story, um, as a backdrop to all this research. And we got the opportunity to go to Cambridge, like I said, to page through those original diaries, also that of Robert Falcon Scott, um, 
you know, which was found about a year after his death um, on their pursuit of the South Pole. And this pole in the middle is like the only known remnant of the endurance. And this is there in Cambridge in the Scott Polar Institute. It's like quite amazing to think that it could still be there, 1915. Um, and there is a replica of the uh, James Kurt. So that is the ship that they did that 1,300, or the scale of ship <laughs> in which they did that 1,300 kilometer voyage. So really amazing. Okay. But we were busy with much more superficial things, like research and a wreck hunt. And the plan before, you know, because as an engineer, it's always this question. So, yes, you think you are going to do that, and this is the plan, and this is what things are designed for. And then the kind of evaluation phase comes when you see, okay, but what actually happened, and how do these things pan out? So we wanted to arrive at, um, not by ship, but by private jet, from Cape Town Airport. So you can see it's a really realistic experience, Shackletonian experience, where you go, have to go to the airport at six o'clock in the morning in the summer, picked up by a private jet and champagne, and five hours later, you are standing back on the landing strip in Wolf's Fan, in Antarctica, in the ice. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. So the team were flown in, our plan was to move directly west in the direction of Paulette Island to the Larsen Sea ice shelf, and we wanted to start with science. So the scientific work would be the first part, and then after about two weeks, um, the proximity to the endurance work site, um, we would kind of utilize that advantage, and also the idea that we are moving a little bit deeper into summer, so hopefully the increased deterioration of ice to go after this wreck. The first question, I mean, aside from the private jet, but is could we even get to the wreck site to start with? And I'm showing you just here some of these ice satellite maps where like a big determinator of whether the SIR gullets can go into an ice infested ocean is determined by number one, is it multi-year ice? And number two, what is the concentration? And the more purple these pictures are, the less, that's 100% or 90%, so not very likely. So the last ship in this area was in 2002, which was an extraordinarily good year. And that was when the German Polar Stern, it's also their polar supply and research ship, actually visited the area. So they were able to do some scientific surveillance. But in 2016, they write about an intermediate year, which looks pretty purple to me, around the Shackleton Red site. And so the big thing was actually that it didn't look very likely, but the pursuit was on. And then I want to talk a little bit technical, because that kind of drives the next research question that I would like to talk about. And that is just the design of the SAO Gallus II. So South Africa has this amazing ship, but one of the biggest investments we had to make was to buy propulsion machinery for the SAO Gallus. So in as far as our budget could stretch, our ship is not really an icebreaker. She's a steel ship that goes in the ice. So yes, there's like 12 megawatts of propulsion power there, which is a big power plant. So the electric motors are 4.5 um, megawatt each, so you can actually get to nine megawatts. But icebreakers go up to 16. So that's a lot of extra money. So our ship is limited by her propulsion design at the onset. And that makes her polar class five. And that means that if it's first year ice, so ice that was formed this year, we can go in that ice um, even if it's 100% concentration. But as soon as you have 100% concentration of multi-year hard, nasty stuff, we cannot go. So, and this type of index is derived by the um, International Maritime Organization as a planning tool. And this is what the planning looked like. So the black part is the Antarctic continent and the Weddell Sea, and the red is where we cannot go. The orange is where we maybe could try to go at limited speed. And the endurance wreck site is right in the center almost of this big red area. But that said, um, if you look to the very, I don't want to put on my pointer because in my video I'm not gonna work. But next to that picture of the captain, you'll see there's a little thumb sticking out there with a red line above it. And that red line is 
um, close to active Bukta, oh, a penguin Bukta, and the ship goes through there, that ice every year. So the Polaris Index by itself gives you good advice, but it does not mean that it's entirely impossible. And that was what the South African hope and the Wednesday expedition hope was kind of riding on. Um, but the thing then is that whereas the ship normally operates to try and avoid ice, this year, as a scientist, I would get the chance to go into hectic ice and to see what our ship is doing. And the question then is, like, was the ship at a limit during this navigation? So I actually approached the ice pilot who is Captain Freddy Lichtalo, and he's been involved with the design of the ship from the onset, a very experienced um, seagoing man, I would say. And uh, I said to him, like, could you write me a report about all the times on this Weddell Sea Expedition where you felt the ship was at risk? Because the question now is, if you have 200 sensors and this major investment, and you're pumping out degrees into the world, like, are you actually doing anything useful? Something which could start to replicate the intelligence or augment the intelligence of the person who makes the main decisions on the ship. Okay, so this is the question with which I set off. So here I'm off to Antarctica in my humble private jet with my boarding pass. And this is the landing strip which my picture does not do justice to, but in there is the twin otter, twin propeller aircraft with its skis and its blade springs. And this has to be one of the highlights of my entire trip because the propellers make such a noise that finally everyone is quiet. So the excitement just, it has to pipe down and make space for the fantastic environment in which you find yourself, which is white landscape where even the shadows of the clouds make something that looks physical. Like here you would ignore the shadow of a cloud or it inconveniences your sunshine, but there it is actually a something with magnificent mountains as we go. And that was, I think, for two and a half to three hours. We landed at a fuel depot and then we were picked up by a helicopter. So it was indeed a tough life. And this then, you know, um, in this landscape of blue and white, which is so surreal, and it feels like you're living your lifetime in literally half a day, is then a picture through the window where you see the SIO Gallus. And I don't know, but the idea that my students have been going on there for years, and this is my first time that I actually go to Antarctica, and the fact that it's kind of home and something that you've studied so much, it's quite an immense experience to arrive there. And you know, this ship was equipped. So if you take South African adventurous spirit and money pounds from the United Kingdom, I think you have quite a powerful team. Because the off deck of our ship, which is normally for brine, was reconfigured into a robotics laboratory. So on the off deck there, we had this picture of the, the orange machine is an AUV. So automated underwater vessel. And the intent of this machine was that it would dive under the ice and survey the sea floor to try and look for the shipwreck. But we were also trying to use it in innovative ways, like in upward looking mode, where we could maybe try and see how thick the ice is. And the ROV is literally like a robot like you see on the Titanic movie, which dives down and has claws and can pick up animal samples and rock samples and can take video footage of the seafloor. So incredible equipment to have on board. And um, in these containers on the off deck, it looked like NASA with all of these screens. And then here is some uh, pictures. Actually, I made a birthday card for my mother. So this is where it comes from, of it like a, a sea pig. I mean, did you even know such a beast exists? But it lives under the ice in Antarctica, <coughs> whether we are looking for it or not. And then you're wondering, like, when is the drama now going to happen? And then it did. On the first dive of this automated underwater vessel, it got stuck under a multi-year ice flow. And they couldn't locate it. So this is like five million pounds lost in a heartbeat before anything. Not the science, not the wreck, not nothing has even stopped. 
And you know, they said to me that one of the great things we're going to do is we're going to study the ice from underneath with this AUV and then there's satellite tracking from above. And we definitely do not want to impact those flows with the ship because it's going to spoil the trajectory. Well, we spent three days in which I obtained epic data ramming this flow over and over and over again. And you can see maybe here is the hole that we made in the flow. And in the end, what they did was this AUV was stuck, like there was a red flag that we were aiming for. And um, they, when we had broken sufficiently the ice, we could watch live on the screens on the ship as that ROV, that yellow robot, went and retrieved the AUV under the ice. And the trick about these AUVs is you have to catch them and get them back to get their data. And here is the data. So this little strip surveys the underside of that multi-year ice flow for how thick the ice is. And the part where it gets so blue, I think the ice was 27 meters at that point. So multi-year compaction and concoction of ice that is growing outwards. The one thing I have to share with you is that the days are 24 hours because the sun never sets. This is close to the end of January where it was getting dark for maybe an hour or two. But you're on a 24-hour science schedule. So whenever you're up, you're up. And sleep becomes really a thing that you have to manage. And I became painfully aware like, of the human condition. And if you think also about the crew, that they are working six-hour shift. The captain, six hours on, six hours off. Three months. And that is your life. Really, really challenging. So the next, um, well, the first threat that this ice pilot identified was when we were on flow expectations. And this is close to Robinson Island, there where the number one is marked on my map. And what we typically had to do before we um, engage in any science is we would look at the satellites. So where are the satellites passing over? Because we want to make a multi-scale investigation of ice. And then we find a flow. So here, the purple and the yellow and the green is the tracking of such a flow. And because of our previous disaster with this um, AUV, we wanted to be in shallower water, because for many reasons the um, vessel there is just much easier to locate. But it wasn't a really well mapped area, which is a risk for the ship. So what happened was, here is Robertson Island, and you can see here this part, this gray part, it is annotated fast ice. So this is land fast ice, which is typically multi-year and very, very hard. And what happened is that, well, so close to this area, we actually deployed people onto an ice flow. But then the unexpected happened. Like the winds rose to 30 knots, not anywhere on any weather prediction, and this flow just started picking up speed. And it was heading straight for land, straight for that land fast ice. And all its other brothers, the other flows, were coming along with it. So now you have people deployed on ice, and this flow, which collides with land and starts rotating, so that the people are not close to you anymore. And I was on the bridge making ice observations at the time, and I promise you, you don't even realize that something dangerous is happening. In the next minute, the captain just puts the ship in full throttle, and we are just starting to break ice. And at the same time, he's on the radio, telling the crew to get the crane operational. And the mist was moving in and visibility was deteriorating. And then you could just feel the ship running out of propulsion power. So shuddering and coming to a stop. And the ice then making this unpredictable crack to where, like, there is the people and there is the crack. And he was swinging the crane out and he could just reach them with the crane. And <coughs> while this is happening, all the other ice is pushing up onto the ship from behind. And we are in shallow, uncharted waters. So a very, very hair-raising experience. And also not possible to move astern or backwards because the ship just starts shuddering and you just feel the propellers interacting with the ice. So the choice was to move forward and break out. Now the question is, like, does, do we measure anything? And I have to tell you that I was very thrilled. This is a torque graph, which is what is the torque at the, the maximum and continuous rating at which the shaft is allowed to operate. There's a red line there at 307 kilometer meter. And the purple, where it exceeds that line, is basically where we are actually picking up 
that this talk is in exceedance of what the design of a ship is. And especially keeping in mind that propellers are designed to be weaker than shafts so that, because it's easier to replace a propeller than a shaft, even though you can't do that in ice either. You have to get towed in. Well, then the next thing that happened was I was left on an island because in the midnight, about uh, two weeks, one week after this uh, expectation happened, the uh, ROV did a preparatory 3,000 meter dive. So we were about to go on the wake out and then an electronic circuit blew for which they didn't have a spare part. And in this lies the hope of actually making an official endurance discovery because you need the ROV to go to depth and photograph the site to say that you have actually found the wreck. So the Widow's Expedition decided that they would try to get parts flown into King George Island. The problem is that it might delay our expedition quite long and that they are worried about the three white desert flights, the private jet flights that have to go back. So they are going to let off the women and the people with small children and the sign. So after working until after midnight, I heard that at six that morning I should be ready to get off. Um, so and go exactly in the opposite direction of my dreams, away from the wreck and onto this rock-ridden island with the ship not showing her best side. And, you know, um, like that, I don't know, like dealing with the unexpected, it's such a bizarre experience to be with your baggage offloaded with no cell phone reception and have no idea how you're going to get back home again. Yet freeing at the same time, which is quite strange. And that evening, we had to walk about half an hour to the waiting room of the airport, so not private jet style. And so this is the waiting room. And they said to us, there's only space for 10 people to be flown out. So just 10 because it's a small airplane. And the next minute lands this commercial jet. So space for 80 people on this gravel land strip. And this is how we were evacuated to um, South America and uh, Punta Arenas. But you know, like being in Antarctica, I remember this slogan at the top of the Scott Polar Institute. They went in search of the poles, and what they ended up finding is the hidden face of God. And I really find this and other experience to be very true to those words. Then the thing that everyone wants to know, and my conclusion quickly, did we make it to the wreck site? So en route to the wreck site, um, on 9 February, the ship was stuck in this multi-year ice for almost 18 hours. And this was actually, um, like you can see the satellite images there, but the ice literally got to almost 100% concentration and there were no leader lines to navigate through anymore. And the ice was pushing up against the ship in a way that you could literally hear her creaking. So here you can see how the ice is at pressure. And this is exactly the thing that ended Shackleton, that ended the endurance. But now we have a maximum ice strength in hull. So this ship has the same level of ice strength in her hull that an icebreaker, so IA1 super icebreaker. But still, um, like rocking from side to side with the container and crane, which is what they sometimes do, and they have big tanks in the belly of the ship where they can pump fluid. Nothing could move her. And then the interesting thing is that um, when the temperature rose just a little bit at high tide, so that makes the circumference of the water a bit bigger, the ice released, and they could progress. And you know, um, there was another instance also on Valentine's Day, 14 February, which was even worse. And this is now those measurements that I told you about that were installed in the ship, like right at the onset. And this uh, graph is made by Chinese students, that's so very minimalistic. But I've marked 1,087 kilonewtons and 1,518 kilonewtons. So in both those cases, our measurements are picking up this critical situation. The design strength of the ship really is 1,650. So actually, we are still fine, although we are quite close. Um, the thing is also that we couldn't actually get ourselves unstuck from the ice um, in a very similar nipping situation on 14 February. And what would also happen is they had the AUV now under the ice looking for the wreck. 
But you have to switch off everything, which is counter to any eye safety intelligence. You don't switch off the engine in ice ever. But they had to do that so that they and this AUV could, could communicate. And that is those like red dead pan line at the bottom of my goal, where the torque literally goes to zero. And you can see that this propulsion system of the ship limits her ability to navigate in ice. And yes, the great reveal, the ship actually did make it to the wreck site. But unfortunately, um, they lost contact with the AUV. So the AUV and the endurance wreck are now somewhere together under the thick ice of the Weddell Sea. So we still don't know if <laughs> she was actually located or not. Which meant, you know, that like one of the greatest highlights and an amazing feat, I just want to add that the crew of the SA Gallus 2, I could have a whole talk just about them, but it is their ingenuity and their South Africanness that made this possible, for sure. Then, um, an interesting part of the captain's report. He says, on the way back to Aktabukta, we were incredibly delayed by harsh weather, where the waves exceeded almost 10 meters. And you know that when I look at this vibration system, remember the one that looks fine the bending and the twisting of the ship. The gray is just the magnitude of acceleration, the peak in every five minutes. And what you can see is that red of the day. That is what we experience in that big storm. And the captain perceives this to be rather inconvenient. And guess what? In the Southern Ocean, we are encountering waves that exceed eight meters on a return period of about 10 days. So these heavy waves are the bread and butter of the SAO Dallas life. And what I see in this vibration measurement, over here these other high dots are also in open water, that the way in which the ship is being bent and twisted is almost more than three times that in open water than what he actually experiences in ice. Oh, I wanted to show you like what the heavy wave slamming actually looks like. I mean, so this is in about four meters of waves. But the reason why the ship also bends so much is because of the shape of the wave. We call it like hogging and sagging moments of the ship. So if you, for instance, look at that uh, picture in the middle with the blue, so the water is pushing up on the bow and on the stern, and the vessel actually is made to bend through by the shape of the wave and the hydrodynamic forces. And you know, the most problematic implication of this ice going design of the SA Gallus and the question as to whether she will really survive 30 years comes from how she actually performs in open water because she's really well designed for ice. Like here is stern standing, which comes from this extension that we did on the off deck to provide for container laboratories. This is also where the ROVs and the AUVs were mounted. But look at the violent wave action that happens there. And the thing is, the captain is not always 100% aware. Like there is a camera on the off deck, but it doesn't really tell you like where people are and what they are doing. Like this guy retrieving equipment from the back deck. Really dangerous. And a very important asset also for oceanography is this instrument called the CTB. It's an instrument with which they um, measure water temperature, salinity, and depth. This is launched from the environmental hangar on the side of the ship. So there they put also a chain to say don't go over the line and then you trip on it on your way back. So I think that this is something where engineering can really make a contribution. So I think what I wanted to say is if I look at the measurements, the majority of the ship's life is spent in open water, not in ice. And that, well, on these measurements over here, the yellow block actually just communicates that if I look at allowable limits for vibration on the ship, that when we are in open water, our structure actually exceeds that. And I think that it exceeds it quite regularly. You know, and that in conclusion, the, um, we are really able to, with sensor measurements, capture some of the experience of a very experienced ice pilot. And also, I think, you know, people who are very experienced in open water navigation, we can do that. And I think that it would potentially be very beneficial, especially for inexperienced or young seamen, to just give them the confidence. So the potential is there, and I think that like, creates a very ripe breeding ground you know, for new students and new studies. 
So then I suppose, like my hope is that where we are looking at human factors, shift responses, and environmental conditions in hindsight. So we can look back and we can say, oh, this was dangerous and that was dangerous, but we are looking back. Um, it would be my ideal that we could use the sensor measurement and engineering techniques to help us to gain insight. So something that would help you right now in deciding whether you continue through this challenging ice or not. Or something even in foresight, you know, if you could look at those predicted ice concentration maps and say, yes, it's 70% chance that we would actually reach the wreck site and the maximum loads on the ship will be this and people are going to be so and so tired and you have to bring an extra captain so that this is all possible. I think that would start becoming very useful. And in terms of the shipping industry, you know, um, there are new technologies where we could start to model the interfaces and even people themselves as digital representation. So if you imagine, for instance, an oil rig where there's 1,800 people working and where you are really tracking, could have the potential to track where they are on the vessel. Are they feeling motion sick? Has a person slept enough? Um, is the motion in that environment so much that they can actually do the cable retrieval operation which you have scheduled? And the SIO Dallas is a platform on which we can develop such services for industry while we also benefiting our own operations. That is one vision. I think that this open water intelligence where we could actually tell the captain, you know, if you are in waves that are approaching head on with this relative orientation, this wave height and this frequency, the ship will slam. The off deck will become uninhabitable. You cannot launch the CTV. This would be useful. And the other application of this is in this cruise industry where people are going from the drag passage. You know um, that the Viking ships are building, I think it's six new PC6 photoclastic ships for tourist operations. They have to go through the roughest ocean, like the Drake Passage, to get to this Antarctic wonderland. And if you could build an intelligence that says that you know, on this voyage, people are just going to throw up so much that it is not economically viable. So let's save the pollution and the discomfort and just call it a day. That would be useful. And finally, you know, using the ship as a center for an environment. So if we could start using the motion of the ship as a local observation of wave measurements, instead of investing in five million rands worth of wave rotor that would just get knocked off anyway by our harsh waves. Or, like I was talking about a bit earlier, if we could use her intelligence, her position and her access to give local observations that could feed back to satellite data, this would be very, very useful. The final branch before you fall asleep is that um, we're also launching a big international project if it gets approved where we want to work on exactly the detailed effects of ice on propulsion machinery. So how does it affect the bearings and the motors and the shaft and the propeller? How do the material properties change to really give an intelligent idea of when you should schedule your maintenance intervals? or whether like these shudders that we are feeling on the propeller actually means that it's best to get out of there as soon as possible. So I would like to say thank you to quite a few people. These are my three students who were on board with me and under the orange umbrella is Prof. Penti Kujala, my collaborator from Finland who's been working with me since 2012. And I would not be able to do any of this without the support of my family and babysitters. So that was the hardest decision in going on this voyage, was actually the decision to leave my family. But uh, um, thank you very much for your attention.